We are here at Click Connect 2024. I have the pleasure of being joined by Mike Potter. Now, Mike is the Chief Technology Officer at Click. Mike, great to see you. Thank you so much for making time to uh, join me, and welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. An absolute pleasure. Well, uh, we're still at the tail end of the second day of an amazing, huge event. Uh, and I imagine by now you, you've, you've had so much <laughs> uh, come at you from different angles with your partners, your integrators, your resellers, your overall integration uh, uh, ecosystem, uh, and your own team that you often probably don't get to see. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been some very big announcements, whether it's your relationship with AWS taking the next natural evolutionary step, or, uh, or, or the completion of the talent integration with uh, data uh, cloud, as it were. And your more recent uh, smaller acquisitions with regard to what's essentially evolved into Click Answers. Yep. Um, I wonder if you could maybe just uh, walk us through, not just so much your role specifically, but sort of the, the types of challenges you've had to face as Chief Technology Officer over the last 12 to 18 months with one of the bigger acquisitions for a long time and then some of the smaller ones and what sort of challenges that presents beyond your normal day-to-day -day CTO role. Well, I mean, uh, you know, uh, there are lots of different types of CTOs, yep. and sometimes the type of CTO you have to play really depends on what's needed at the time. Right. right? And so, you know, when we uh, we you know, joined forces with Talend, uh, it not only represented uh, the single biggest acquisition that Click has ever done, but it also represented a new level of complexity, not only in terms of you know how do we integrate the product, yeah. but how do we integrate clouds, how do we integrate all the functions, ways of working, etc., and so forth. And so, uh, my role was really about ensuring that. Uh, as we started to formulate the new business units around data integration and data analytics, that I, uh, I provided a level of uh, consistency across the portfolio, um, making sure that the architecture, um, um, the platform, um, how our cloud operates uh, at scale and in a production, as well as uh, you know design and, and just you know how we build and deliver software on a continuous basis, um, has a consistent approach, um, working very closely with the BUs so that they could really focus on being productive yep. um, while uh, ensuring that the, the guardrails and the safety nets are there um, around quality and around uh, making sure that we don't actually break our production environment. So yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of things to juggle, a lot of things to consider, and, and also the fact that we're uh, learning how uh, each other's worked, uh, you know, new cultures involved, new people, yeah. and, uh, and so it, it, it made for a very busy year. It would indeed, and congratulations on pulling it all together on all uh, of those fronts. Um, yeah, I, I imagine there's also, though, you've got a slightly unfair advantage in that is that you are a data company, you are a technology company, so you, in many ways you're, use, you're your own first customer using your own tools to implement some of those, is that fair to say? Yes. Um, yeah, I think for us it, it's um, a, a big part of what we do is actually uh, measuring ourselves. Yeah. And um, uh, one of the things that I'm particularly proud of over the past year is uh, we really took a lot of effort around cost-based architecture uh, yeah. in the cloud. Uh, you know, we want to maintain a high margin value uh, for, the, for what, we're, what we're delivered with our SaaS offering. And, and every time you change the cloud, you run the risk of breaking that. Yes, yes. And so we've developed a real discipline throughout the organization to understand not only where our costs are today, but what changes are, occur to help us reduce costs versus uh, uh, increase costs. And I'm really proud to say that while we have had nonlinear growth um, across all, all 13 workloads that we have, um, uh, at wow. the same time we reduce costs by 10%. Wow, so that's a non-trivial dollar figure. Yeah, um, <laughs> somebody's getting a bonus somewhere there. I hope. <laughs> um, when we were off camera a moment ago, also, if we can just go a little segue, you, you mentioned that uh, you know you've got a broader remit than just within Click and, and, and the various organizations you bring together, but also within your ecosystem of partners, integrators, and resellers, and your customers. I wonder if you can just give us a, a sense of kind of what that feels like as far as the CTO function goes liaising with them, working with them, integrating with them, and, and I guess in many ways supporting them. Well, um, so one of the things that uh, is really important is making sure that we are uh, customer first uh, in, our, in our approach. And in fact, I actually have a team in uh, my group called Customer First. Oh, wow. And they work very closely with our support organization, our, our field teams, our partners, to make sure that um, uh, what the, you know, the customer orientation is always at the top of the priority. Yeah, yeah. And at the same time, dealing uh, with it both proactively, ensuring customers are set up for success, but also when there's an escalation, really shortcutting the turnaround time and, and helping their R&D uh, teams yeah. get right to where the problem is, get a fix to the customer, and managing and supporting the, the teams in the field and support to 
make sure that happens. And so, um, you know, on top of that, I, I have uh, you know lots of great opportunity to sit down and, and talk to customers, uh, uh, speak with partners as well, just to make sure um, they're being heard and making sure that that translates into. Um, uh, what ultimately will land either as, as uh, requirements on the product, requirements in the architecture, or requirements in terms of supporting them. And then internally, we also have to do the same thing, right? Because yes. um, you know, our, our uh, customer success team uh, often needs things that, uh, from the product so that they can do their jobs. And so yeah. you know, having a close liaison with them as a form of customer also is important. Yeah, you are your own first customer in many ways. And, and, and you know, a, all of what you said there speaks directly to, I guess, what has been the core of, of Click as an organization, which is listening to your customers and implementing what they require as opposed to trying to build something that they may or may not need. I know last year, a lot of the messaging around this event last year was that very thing of bringing everyone together and listening to those customers, having those conversations. And this, is, this year is built on that yet again, that so many people have been meeting together, having conversations, talking about what they're doing together and how they can build each other up. And then Click has been at the table listening to that and figuring out how they can then take those learnings away and build onto that. I wonder if I can get you to maybe just uh, share also some of the thoughts around uh, you know, how you see the evolution of, of CTO evolving as AI becomes sort of quote unquote baked into the DNA of everything we use. Well, I think you know, um, uh, you know, the advancements we've made um, uh, you know, with the advent of uh, uh, Gen AI and, and, and technologies like uh, ChatGPT has yeah. really changed um, a lot around our relationship with our customers. Um, that technology, I think, really opened up the aperture to a, a broader audience of varied skills and being able to interact with systems in a, a new and a novel yeah. way. And, and I think that's had a real um, a ripple effect in terms of how we approach building software moving forward. Um, you know, there's going to be an expectation that um, not only does um, uh, you know, being able to interact with unstructured data, but also be able to interact with structured data in a similar fashion. And we've always had that capability through our chat interfaces yep. and things like that. But now what we're talking about is the world of structured and unstructured together. And, and, and that's, a, that's a new way of looking at it from um, um, uh, you know, an AI perspective, mm -hmm. right? And more importantly, I think what AI is doing is it's also forcing us to rethink the way we even build software. Right, so right. being able to leverage you know, co-pilots in terms of uh, empowering developers to be yep. more productive, um, being able to use tech, the technology to, to help with generating test cases and building mm -hmm. you know, test data, synthesized synth synth yeah. data for building t testing. So it has an impact on, on the product we build, it has impact on the way we build it, and then last but not least, I think it also has an impact on the way we uh, look at how we scale. Right. right, and how we perform it uh, in a production environment. Because these technologies um, uh, can be very expensive if done badly, yes. we have to be very <laughs> smart about what use cases we go after and how we solve for them. Yes, things break very quickly when they move quickly. Uh, I was talking to Chris Powell, your, uh, your, your associate, uh, who's your chief marketing officer, and he was saying that uh, a lot of the change in his, his world uh, has been things like having a junior copywriter that's a generative AI, and I imagine eventually you're going to have a point where there's like a junior coder who's a generative AI and a junior log checker and, a, and so forth. And, and do you see that sort of then bringing a substantial, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, an additional breadth to the team where if you have one subject matter expert, if they can have 20 or 30 gen AI tools, then expanding that, there's almost like adding a fifth and sixth finger, or what it might be to your team, well, I, without I, necessarily the human cost of another job. Yeah, I think the, um, I mean, um, We've always had the benefit of cogeneration yep. in, in a you know it's been around for you know 30 years, 40 years, right? Um, I think that the, what's different this time around is really just the the level of accessibility for you know developers as they're doing their jobs, yep. and yep. and I think the goal of it is to make sure that developers can start working on really producing novel code, right. code that is really the core IP, that is really the the secret yep. sauce, yep. while more route uh, development activities become up progressively more automated. However, it doesn't take the, the, the developer off the hook. They, uh, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. If they leverage a, a technology like this, they are ultimately accountable for the code that gets yeah. produced yeah. by it, and they have to understand how it works, because otherwise it can't be maintained. Yes. And so um, I think there's still some um, uh, time to go by to decide how much of a productivity gain we'll ultimately get. Okay. Um, it just may sort of, it'll definitely change the landscape, um, uh, but I, I think there's going to be some wins and some lose, losses uh, as a result. Yeah, there's always that risk, as you just alluded there to, there's something becoming a black box and we know how we built it and we know what we feed it, but we then generally don't know what's happening inside it to spit out the stuff we're 
thinking we want from it, uh, and therefore we, we have questions to ask around that, right? Well, and, and, and if you got, you know, if you have a situation where you have a defect in this generated code and you've got yep. no developers who know how, knows how it work, works, you, you're going to extend your turnaround time for resolution, because yep. they've got to learn the code, right? Yeah, Particularly exactly. if they haven't taken the time to learn it before they, up front. Yeah, yeah. And so there's some really interesting challenges there um, uh, with that. And at the same time, there could be some huge productivity gains if you do it the right way. And so it's really about building that culture and, and reestablishing that culture around uh, development with this type of technology. And that's really, I, I, and that's you know, in essence, what what Click has been offering for for now 31 years, isn't it? It's like the ability to figure out what's happening in your data and make it sensible and usable, then do the analysis on it, and then get some sort of insights into it. Uh, and, and listening to what you're saying there now, a lot of that sort of you know, baked into the DNA, what you're doing with regard to how you approach not just the challenges of acquisitions that are, that are, that are Herculean challenges, but also your day-to-day -day tasks and working with your customers. I wonder if you could wrap us up with uh, some advice that you might offer your uh, peer your peers in the sort of CTO role um, and, the, and the associated roles with regard to where Click can help them address the very same types of challenges that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, particularly uh, not just so much uh, the data aspect, but also how they approach their adoption of AI. Uh, as it, and often people are saying that AI is hap happening to them faster than they can cope with. What sort of advice would you give to your peer CTOs sort of as to how they approach not just the data element, but also now the adoption of AI? Yeah, um, I think that uh, the simplest message I could offer is that uh, uh, AI, generative AI, it's not a quick fix right. on a good data strategy. It's not a quick fix on an analytics strategy. Um, it's not a quick fix on you know the skill sets and the types of employees that you need to be mm -hmm. successful. Mm -hmm. um, in many respects, it actually emphasizes the need to have that those things in place because right. you need good data in order to build good analytics yeah. in order for the AI to really be a, a force multiplier. And so where I worry about is sometimes you see decisions getting made um, where they're hoping AI is a replacement for. Right. And that's short-sighted. Yeah, it uh, sort of comes back to a lot of messaging this week as well, which is that humans should still not only be in the loop, but actually be overseeing and governing in that and directing and putting guardrails around it uh, to ensure that it's going the direction we want. That's exactly right. Well, Mike, uh, fantastic to catch up with you. Thank you so much for making time. It's been great to have you on the show, and hopefully we'll have you back again soon. But congratulations on an amazing event around here. It's been fantastic to be part of it, and thank you very much for having me here. And uh, safe travels getting back home. And in the meantime, I hope you have a fantastic evening at the, uh, the wrapping up uh, event. Great, thank you. Thanks, Mike, appreciate it.